Well, I want to welcome you here to Kingston West Free Methodist Church today, and we're glad that you've joined us. A few announcements for you, for our church family specifically, for this coming week. Monday evening, tomorrow night, will be our a meeting, a board meeting via Zoom, and we would appreciate your prayers as we begin the discussions and the measures that are needed to be in place uh, before we can consider uh, moving back into in-person services again. Because of the board meeting, the men's study will not take place on Monday evening and will resume Monday, July 20th. And our virtual prayer meeting will continue each Thursday at 1.30 p.m. Please refer to your newsletter for ways that uh, you can connect. And our Wednesday evening virtual fellowship has been canceled for now. Most of you are out enjoying uh, this beautiful, warm, sunny, sunny summer weather. So enjoy that time. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 95, verses 1 to 3. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Let us pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this time that we can be together today in this way. And Lord, we just pray that as we open up your word and as we begin our or continue in our journey in James, that you would use these words to encourage your people and to help us strive to reflect your son, Jesus Christ, um, to the world around us. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Well, our scripture reading comes again from James. It's chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. I think a fairly well-known passage of scripture for many of us. Probably not one of the most favorite scriptures, as we recall. Anyways, let me share it with you. It's called Controlling the Tongue. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by the means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or A grapevine produce figs. No, and you cannot draw fresh water from a salty spring. May the Lord speak to our hearts through this word as we open it up and as we examine it. Title of the message today is Changing Your Words. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you said something and immediately following those words, you had an overwhelming sense that you shouldn't have said that? And then you wish you could take the words back. Now, I'm guessing because, I, of course, I cannot see you, that the majority of us nodded our heads, me included. We've all had this experience in these situations. Once the words have left our mouth, the damage is done. Words have a huge impact on our lives. They shape us both in positive ways and in negative ways. 
You know, I remember as a child going home crying to my parents about something mean that someone had said to me. And my mom and dad would always say, well, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And so the next time someone was mean to me, I can recall shouting back at the top of my lungs that's that slogan. But as you know, it never changes the damage of the words. The pain is still there. It's never taken away. So today we're going to spend some time looking at the impact that our words can have on our world and and in our lives. Norman Vincent Peale made a statement that has been recited by many people over the years. He said, change your thoughts and you'll change your world. And there's a lot of truth to this statement. Well, in today's text, James James is presenting a similar truism that we need to take just as seriously. Here it is. Change your words and you'll change yourself. This is the key verse of our text today is verse two. We all make many mistakes, but those who control their tongues can also control themselves in every other way. James is saying that in order to become the kind of person you want to become, to be in control of your life, you begin by taking control of your tongue. Now you might say, is it really that simple? Is it really that easy? Well, the answer is yes and no. It is really that simple, but it's not that easy. And I think all of us understand that when we've tried to control our tongue, it's not an easy thing. It has to be learned. In this passage, James describes the awesome power of the tongue. Listen again to what he says in verses three to six. We can make a large horse turn around and go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a tiny rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. So also the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction for it is set on fire by hell itself. Wow, what a sobering reminder of the power of the tongue. Now, we see here that James is focusing on the negative aspects of what our words can do because he's writing this chapter as a warning to believers to begin to take seriously what they say. We must also remember that the opposite is true. Just as words can be used to destroy, they can also be used to build. Just as words can be used to hurt, they can also be used to heal. So we need to be careful how we use our words. James compares the tongue to a ship's rudder, saying how the tiny rudder can turn a mighty ship this way and that. Well, today we're going to look at three ships that your tongue controls. The ability to provide leadership, the ability to build relationships, and the ability to participate in worship. If you steer your tongue in the wrong direction, you can destroy all three of these. But if you steer your tongue in the right direction, you can empower your life in all three areas. And as a result, you'll be greatly blessed. So let's take a look at how your words affect these three areas of your life. First of all, let's look at how your words affect your ability to provide leadership. James begins this chapter by saying in verse 1, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged by God with greater strictness. Let me just say that this verse scares me. It scares me enough that I try very hard to make sure what I share with you week after week is based on and rooted in the scriptures. The bottom line is that I have nothing new to say. 
All that needs to be said can be found in God's word. What I endeavor to do is to relate his word to our world, helping us all to apply his truths into our lives. And my hope and my prayer is that what I do will propel you to dig deeper into God's word yourself so that you can hear him speak to you. James begins this chapter with this warning. And then he begins talking about the danger of the tongue. That's because your ability to lead is directly proportional to your ability to bridle your tongue. If you don't have control over your tongue, you're not ready to be a leader. And if you are a leader, your inability to control your tongue will prevent you from moving forward in your leadership role. Just as a side note, so that you're not tuning me out here, James is speaking to leaders, and it might be easy for you to say, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not a pastor or a teacher in the church. However, I'd like to suggest that you are a leader at some level. If you're a parent, a grandparent, a manager in business, or in the areas where you are teaching, training, or mentoring, you are leading. You're influencing others. And as leaders, we need to have control of our tongue. You know, I have friends in ministry who really struggle in this area. These are gifted pastors who desire to be used by God in their ministries, but they let their tongue get in the way. Some of them have spoken harshly to others in the church. Others have broken confidences, and as a result, they find themselves moving a lot. And they have difficulty providing leadership to their congregations. Now, I want to be careful not to point fingers here, because as James says, this is an area where we all stumble. But those who are called to leadership must understand that we will be held especially accountable for what we say. Therefore, we must be especially careful. I read about a former basketball coach by the name of Bobby Knight. I don't watch basketball, so I have no clue who he is, but I have seen this type of situation lived out uh, many, many times. Bobby was known for getting into trouble more than a few times by saying the wrong thing. Of course, he often blamed it on the sports writers, saying he was misquoted. And one time he was asked a question at a press conference, and he responded with a very long pause. And then he said, did you get that? It was absolute silence. That's the only thing a sports writer can quote accurately. You know, actually absolute silence isn't a bad idea from time to time. You know, part of the problem is that we think we always, we've always got to be talking. When someone comes to us with a problem, we think we've got to give them a solution whether we know the solution or not. And so we ramble on and on, even if we have no idea what we're talking about. If you've ever been through a tragedy, you know how easily the pain of that tragedy can be compounded by supposedly well-meaning people coming up and saying the most inappropriate things. I've heard horror stories from people who have been in situations like this. One of my professors from college said that when his wife was young, her dad died rather suddenly. And at the funeral, a Christian gentleman, a leader in the church, approached the widow and said to her, you must have done something really bad to have had this happen. This person was not well-meaning. He was just mean. The lesson my professor was illustrating to us was that if you don't know what to say, don't say anything. (coughs) Leaders need to learn that when you don't know the right thing to say, it's best to say nothing at all. Your tongue affects your ability to provide leadership like a rudder of a ship can steer it off course or it can keep it on course. Leaders, use your words carefully and don't be afraid to say nothing at all, especially when you're leading in a difficult area. Listen to King David's words. I said to myself, I will watch what I do and not sin in what I say. 
I will curb my tongue when the ungodly are around me. Psalm 39 verse 1. You know, there are countless leaders today who wish that in the heat of the moment they had chosen to say less. Don't make the same mistake. Be aware of the damage that the tongue can do and how it can affect your ability to provide leadership. That's one chip. Secondly, let's take a look at how the tongue affects the ability to build relationships. Think of this. Most of your relationships consist almost exclusively of words. There are a few exceptions, but for the most part, your relationships are made up of what you say to one another. Take Pastor Keith, for example. We're friends, as are the rest of you. We've been friends since we met. I don't know what Keith really thinks of me because I can't read his thoughts, but I can understand his words. Our relationship exists primarily in what we say to one another. Occasionally, he'll do something nice like buy me a coffee and a donut, but that's not why we're friends. We're friends because we have conversations that build each other up. We encourage one another. We advise one another. We even instruct one another sometimes. We have a friendship because of the words we speak to each other. Think for a moment about a relationship that you have that isn't working at full capacity right now. There's some conflict maybe going on. A relationship, maybe it's with one of your children or, or with your parents or with your spouse or with someone at work or maybe a neighbor, take a moment to think about, about it. And the chances are the use of words probably plays a serious role in that conflict, especially if it's a family conflict. Now, I don't want to oversimplify this. There are other sources of conflict. But the way we speak to one another has a lot to do with how well we get along with one another. James says that the tongue is an uncontrollable evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it breaks out into curses against those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Verse 8 to 10. James is saying it's wrong to curse or insult or speak harshly against others. When you do, your words have the effect of poison. They destroy your relationships. This is why Paul said, do not use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Ephesians 4, 29. Just as relationships can be destroyed by wrong words, they can be built up by right words. And I encourage you to strive to build your relationships on a foundation of kind words. You know, some people think they're being real or honest or transparent when they speak harshly, but really, they're only being destructive. In his book, The Youth Builder, Jim Burns talked about how important it is to build up others with affirmation. He said, for every critical comment we receive, it takes nine affirming comments to even out the negative effect in our life. And most young people receive more critical comments in a day than encouraging ones. You can have a very positive life transforming effect when you develop a ministry of affirmation. Think again of those close to you, your spouse, your children, your friends, your parents. How many encouraging comments do you think they hear each day? Do you remember the last time you encouraged your, your spouse or your child? The book of Hebrews says, encourage one another daily, Hebrews 3.13. And I want to encourage you to give it a try. See if you can get in the habit of building up those around you. The same holds true here as it does for leaders. Sometimes the best thing to say is say nothing at all. Sometimes when you feel your emotions getting stirred and you feel like you want to lash out at someone and say what's really on your mind, try biting your tongue and keeping your thoughts to yourself. Solomon said in Proverbs 11, verse 12, it is foolish to belittle a neighbor. A person with good sense remains silent. Be aware of the damage that the tongue can do and how it can affect your ability to build relationships. That's the second ship. 
Let's look at how the tongue affects now your ability to participate in worship. James said, verses 9 to 12, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it breaks out into curses against those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing comes pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with fresh water and bitter water? Can you pick olives from a fig tree or figs from a grapevine? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty pool. James is saying that there must be consistency between the way we address others and the way we address God. I've had this happen a few times over my years in ministry where I'm just about to go to the front of the church to begin the worship service when somebody pulls me aside and proceeds to take a strip off of me. And after a few minutes of listening to this, I have to excuse myself and go and lead the worship service. Now, during the service, when I look at that person who just, you know, tore a strip off me, they're singing and worshiping, worshiping God like nothing had ever happened. And it kind of puzzles me how one minute they can be furious with me and the next they can be worshiping God. There seems to be, to me, an inconsistency there. Again, I want to be careful here not to throw stones because James reminds us that we all stumble in this area. What I want to encourage each of us to do is to examine our own hearts to see that there is consistency in how you speak to others and how you speak to God. You can't claim to speak well of God while you speak ill of others. It's a contradiction. If you want, to, if you want your worship to be pleasing to God, you have to take control of your tongue. How you speak directly affects your ability to participate in worship. This is the third ship that your tongue can control like a rudder. You know, when you're sick and you go to the doctor, what's one of the things the doctor often does? He says, let me see your tongue. You know, it seems like the doctor is always able to tell what's wrong with you just by looking at your tongue, doesn't it? This is also true in a spiritual sense. Your tongue has the ability to spread poison throughout your life and it can infect everyone around you. That's why James gives us a very solemn warning about the tongue. He says, it is full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It doesn't have to be that way. Instead of speaking words that belittle others, you can speak words that bless others. Instead of speaking words that hurt, you can speak words that heal. Instead of speaking words of criticism, you can speak words of encouragement. The tongue is powerful, not only in its ability to wreak havoc, but in its ability to create lasting change in your life. Those who control their tongues can also control themselves in every other area. Verse 2. Let's learn to control our tongues because when we change our words, we'll begin to change ourselves. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for um, its challenges in our lives. And Lord, we acknowledge that uh, we need your Holy Spirit to guide us when we use our words. Help us to be in tune with you and what you are saying to us. And Lord, use us to, be, to build up others, to be an encouragement to others. And uh, Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us. It's been good to have you join us. I encourage you uh, to leave us a comment either on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page, or however you connected with us. It'd be great to hear from you. It'd be a great encouragement uh, to hear from you. So just as we close, let me just share in a benediction one of my favorite passages of scriptures found <coughs> in Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless and have a great week ahead.